And this is BBC One with The Sky at Night. Good evening. For this programme, we're going to stay near home and talk mainly about the Leonid meteors. But first of all, we're coming even nearer home because on October the 21st, there was a brilliant display of northern lights or aurora. And this lovely photograph was taken by Douglas Arnold from Hampshire. And we don't often see aurorae as far south as that. They are due to electrified particles from the sun striking the upper air and making it glow. And then, six days later, a very brilliant fireball shot across the country and was widely seen from Sussex up to Lincolnshire. A really brilliant thing and it exploded. Now we'd like to know just how it moved. Therefore, if you did see it, will you please write and let us know and I'll give you the address at the end of the programme. On to planets now. Venus has been brilliant in the dawn sky, it still is. And at the moment, Venus and the other inner planet, Mercury, are close together. And Mercury on the whole is pretty elusive and this conjunction will go on for the first two weeks of November. And it's a very good time to find Mercury. The other inner planet, Mars, is still on view in the southwest after dark. And here's a lovely picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. On the left, Mars as it normally is. On the right, a major dust storm that covered the entire Martian surface. And on October 24th, the probe, Odyssey, actually reached Mars and went into orbit around the planet. That will stabilize this orbit later on and carry a long program of Martian mapping and we'll keep you posted. Another triumph also, September 22nd, the probe Deep Space One flew past Borelli's periodical comet and sent back a close range picture of a comet nucleus, about uh, five miles long and two and a half miles wide. The first time a naked comet has been seen since the time of Halley's comet. Now comets are ghostly things, the insubstantial parts of the nucleus, and occasionally we get a bright one. Remember Hale Popov a few years ago, the photograph I took from Celsi. And when a comet comes into the sun, it uh, becomes active, gases and dust are sent out, and the comet surrounds itself with a kind of head and coma, and dusty particles are spread out, and finally spread out all along the comet's orbit. Now if we go through the trail of one of these comets, the particles dash into the air, and the particle coming in at anything up to 45 miles a second will burn away in the Swedish call a shooting star or meteor. And in November, we go through the trail of one comet and we see a shower of meteors, and they're known as the Leonids, but their radiant point is the constellation of Leo the Lion. Now there's Leo, to find it, you the point is in the path the wrong way, and there is Leo, and there's the position of the radiant. Now the meteors are really trailing through space in parallel paths, but by the effect of perspective, they appear to come from one point and they can be pretty spectacular. The parent comet, I may say, is called Temple Tuple. That comes back every 33 years. And here's a picture of it, its last return in 1998, taken by Martin Mobley. Well, we may, I say may, have a really good Leander display this month. And uh, who better to tell us about it than Dr. John Mason? Welcome back, John. Well, what do we expect? Well, of course, every time the parent comet of the Leonids comes round, about three times a century, it lays down a new trail of dust. To start with, the dust in that trail is concentrated, but over time it spreads out. And over hundreds of years, that dust dissipates to become part of the main Leonid swarm. Now, the dust is unevenly distributed, such that near the comet, there are these dense filaments of dust, and they extend from a few years before the comet passes by to a few years after it has gone by. And that is when, if the Earth goes through one of those filaments, uh, we will see a brief but spectacular shower. And if we go right through the core of a filament, maybe even a meteor storm, where the meteor rate may be up to 10,000 times greater than normal. Now, the Leonids have produced some of the greatest meteor displays of the past thousand years. The first really well-recorded display was in November 1799, when it was well seen by the explorer Alexander von Humboldt and his companion Aimé Bonpland from South America. 
In 1833, there was perhaps one of the greatest Leonid storms of all time. This time, it was well seen from the eastern part of the United States, and rates at that time were probably tens of thousands of meters per hour for a short time. 33 years later, we had another Leonid storm. This time, Europe was favored, and it was well seen from Britain, including observations made from Greenwich. If you look at the activity curve here, you can see that the rates at peak were 120 metres a minute, 7,200 an hour. But the peak was very, very narrow, no more than an hour or two in width, and that's very typical of these intense meteor displays from the Leonids. Well, we had to wait another 100 years for another great Leonid display. Planetary perturbations moved the filaments away from the Earth's orbit, but then over time it moved them back again. And on November the 17th, at 1966, there was the most intense meteor storm of the 20th century. And that storm was caused by the 1899 filament of dust laid down by the comet 67 years earlier. And because it was a young filament, the particles were still densely concentrated. Well, the apparent comment came back in 1998, so what about any great displays this time round? Well, we began to see enhanced activity as early as 1994, and it picked up year on year as, as the comet uh, came nearer. Um, there was actually no meteor storm in 1998, the year the comet returned, but there was um, a very spectacular shower of bright fireballs some 16 hours earlier than the predicted peak. And in this video clip, uh, we can see uh, some of the bright fireballs that were seen uh, at that time. They were caused by large uh, dust grains. Um, it was an old filament of dust injected as long ago as 1333, and that meant that we had very big particles producing beautiful fireballs like this one, photographed by Lorenzo Lovato. Now, the distribution of dust tells us that it was most likely that we'd get uh, a meteor storm after the comet had returned, and 1999 was the year that we thought was most likely. Now, there were many predictions of what was going to happen. But one of the most interesting to emerge was the dust trail model put forward by David Asher of the Armagh Observatory and Robert McNaught of the Australian National University. Now, what they tried to do is to model the dust trails laid down by the comet over many returns and work out their positions in space relative to the Earth's orbit. They want to try and work out where the filaments are so they can determine which filaments the Earth will pass closest to and the timing at which the Earth is closest to the cores of those filaments. Because obviously timing's all important mm. when the filaments are so narrow and the peaks are only an hour or two in width. Now, this is a three-dimensional problem, so it's quite a difficult thing to understand. So we've tried to set up a demonstration here in the studio. This blue ball represents the Earth, and this rod here is the Earth's orbit as it moves around the Sun. And what we're going to do is to use coloured light beams to represent the filaments of dust laid down by the comet at the point where the comet's orbit intersects that of the Earth. For simplicity, we're just going to consider the three most important dust filaments, and we're going to represent those by a different coloured light beam. Now, because the comet's orbit crosses the plane of the Earth's orbit at quite a shallow angle, just 17 and a half degrees, and because the comet's moving in a retrograde or wrong way direction, that means that the Earth ploughs into the filaments of dust more or less head on. Right, John, um, will you use this apparatus to describe exactly what happens? Well, first of all, let's look at the situation as it was in 1999. We've got three filaments, the 1932 filament in red, the 1899 filament in blue, and the 1866 filament in green. Now, as we move the Earth through the stream in November 1999, we first encounter the 1932 filament. Then, almost immediately, we go through the 1899 filament. And then, after a bit of a gap, we encounter the 1866 filament. Now, there's another way in which we can look at this. We can use a graphic to look down on the Earth's orbit to see what the positioning of the filaments is relative to the path of the Earth through them. Here, the Earth's orbit is the blue line, and the Earth is coming up from the bottom right. You can see it first passes just outside the 1932 filament in red, then very close, but just inside the 1899 filament, almost immediately afterwards, and then a bit later, just outside the 1866 filament in green. 
The key thing in 1999 was going to be the close passage just inside the 1899 trail. And Asher and McNaught predicted that we would be closest to that trail at about 0208 UT on November the 18th. Well, this is what actually happened. You can see from this activity curve that meteor rates rose very sharply um, early on November the 18th. In fact, that peak goes up to about ten times the height of your television set. And there's then another peak rather later on. If we zoom in onto that sharp peak, we can see that the rates at maximum were about three and a half thousand an hour. That's about one a second. Now, I was in the Sinai Desert observing mm. with quite a few people, and we saw an absolutely magnificent display. Uh, you can see some of the meteors here. And the, we had a superb observing conditions. Here's a lovely picture by Nigel Evans showing all the Leonids streaking away from the radiant. And, of course, the peak uh, of the shower coincided with the 1899 trail but shortly before that you can see that little blip on the rising portion well that coincides with the 1932 trail and um, some hours later at about 1600 hours on November the 18th near the expected time of passing of the 1866 trail there was a little blip um, of about 150 metres per hour, which you can clearly see there. So the observed time of the 1899 maximum was within five minutes of the time predicted by the Asher and McNaught model. Uh, a really remarkable achievement. And in fact, the other predicted times were pretty close as well. I quite agree. And they were also pretty accurate last year. Yes, indeed. Let's use our light beam model to see what happened in November 2000. Once again, we have three different filaments. We have the 1932 filament in blue, the 1733 in red, and the 1866 in green. And as we move the Earth through the stream, as happened last November, it, the Earth first passes through the 1932 filament, then there's a bit of a gap, and it encounters in fairly quick succession the 1733 filament followed by that in 1866. Now we can obviously again look at that in our simple 2D diagram looking down on the orbit from above. Again the Earth is moving from the bottom right. You can see it first passes quite a way uh, inside the 1932 filament and then just outside the 1733 and 1866 filaments shown there in red and green. Uh, unfortunately, observations were severely hampered by bright moonlight, but certainly there was no meteor storm. We didn't really expect yeah. one because we didn't pass very close to a filament as we did in 1999. You can see there are sort of three different peaks of activity. Uh, the first occurred at about five past eight uh, on November the 17th. Um, and if we zoom into that peak, you can see there it's uh, not a particularly high one, only goes up to about 150 metres per hour. And it occurred roughly 15 minutes after the predicted time for closest approach to the 1932 trail. Then if we look at what happened the next day, we see quite a complex pattern of activity on November the 18th. Um, in the early hours, there's sort of a flattened peak, a plateau, if you like, and that uh, corresponds to rates of about 270 metres per hour, roughly coincident with the time of the 1733 trail. But the highest rates were observed about 10 past 7 in the morning, and that uh, reached about 500 metres per hour, and was about 45 minutes or so uh, before the predicted time of the 1866 trail crossing. While it's true that the agreement between the observations and the predictions was not as good in 2000 as it had been the year before, in 1999, it's not really surprising, because in 2000 the Earth did not pass through the core of any of the filaments. It was uh, well removed from the cores, and the particles are more um, diffusely spread in those regions. In addition, the angle at which the filaments come in introduces a bit of variation depending on whether the Earth passes to one side or the other of the centre of the filament. Let's imagine that my fist uh, is the Earth. If the Earth passes on the outside edge of the filament, then you meet the filament early and you can see my fist lighting up. If, uh, if the Earth passes inside the filament, then it actually lights up a bit later and you can see it lighting up there. So depending on which side of the uh, filament it goes, the maximum may be either earlier or later than the prediction. And so all things considered, uh, I think that the degree of agreement between the observations and predictions is actually quite good. I think it's very good indeed. All right, John, now let's sum up. What do you expect this time? Are we going to get a good show or aren't we? 
Well, let's go back to our light beam model one last time. The, uh, again, we have three filaments. We have 1767 in blue, 1699 in green, and 1866 in red. Now, as the Earth comes in, uh, nothing happens in the early part of the encounter. But then we go through the 1767 filament, and then in very rapid succession through the 1699 and 1866 filaments, and in fact, the two almost overlap. We can see that more clearly on our 2D graphic here. Again, the Earth is coming in from bottom right. The Earth orbits the blue line. So there's no close encounter on November the 17th. We go more or less between the 1932 and 65 filaments. But then we go just inside the 1767 filament. And then the 1699 and 1866 filaments, well, they almost overlap. You can hardly separate them there, the green and red ovals towards the top left of the diagram. So the chances of a meteor storm this year have got to be very good, possibly with rates even higher than they were in 1999. But one thing, of course, if we're going to see meteors, the sky has got to be dark. Yes, indeed. Let's have a look at a graphic of the rotating Earth with the night and day hemispheres shown. Well, we first passed close to the 1767 trail uh, at around 10 o'clock in the morning on November the 18th. And that's well after sunrise from Britain, although observers in the United States will be well placed. The next peak, due to the 1699 trail, is at about 1730 UT on the same day. And the final peak, caused by the 1866 trail, around 50 minutes later at about 1820. Now, both these peaks occur after sunset from Britain, but although the sky will be dark, the Leonid Radiant will be below the horizon, which is unfortunate because that's when we expect a meteor storm to occur if one does. If we look at this graph of the Leonid Radiant elevation, we can see that the Radiant rises about 10.30 in the evening and then gets steadily higher towards dawn. So the best time to see Leonid meteors is in the early morning hours. Now, I would urge people to wrap up warmly and go out during the early morning hours of November the 18th and from about 11 p.m. onwards that night into the early morning of the 19th. There may well be a lot of Leonid meteor activity. You never know what might happen. For example, there could be unexpected activity from one of the filaments we haven't considered. But most importantly, there's significant Leonid activity even between the main peaks with rates of 100 meteors per hour or more. So it'll be well worth people going out and I hope they'll give it a try. Well, I certainly will from Celsius. Now, where will you be, John? I shall be on the island of Palau in the Western Pacific Ocean, hoping to be in the right place at the right time and with a clear sky. I hope you are, John. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, please remember, if you saw that brilliant fireball on the October 27, please let us have the details. And this is the address, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W127TS. There is, of course, our web, the usual number, www.bbc.co.uk slash space, or CFAX, page 620. And um, when I come back next month, I'll be joined by David Hughes and Mark Kidger. We'll be talking about the Star of Bethlehem. As we all have totally different ideas, it should be rather fun. Meanwhile, let's hope for a really clear sky on the night of November 1718 and look out for those Leonids. Until next month, good night.